Hey, welcome to the Cam and Otis Show. Uh, on this episode, Army veteran, and, and those of you on the YouTube, I ain't got to tell you this, but first of the 501st, man, I used to know, I used to know what all them little, them little first, you know, first of the 501st, right, first right, of the 505th, right. I used to know all their little regimental things because guys would always yell it when I was around and I never, I was never in one of those units, but hey, Mark, Mark Delaney, great, glad you're joining us, man. Good to see you this morning. Hey, really appreciate being on the show today. Super pumped to talk to talk to both of you. Hey, I just want to I want to get into something real quick. I, I just want to I'm not going to I'm not going to beat around the bush. Not that I ever have. I want to get into this project because you and I talked uh, when we did our pre-show and we just talked a little bit more about it in the uh, green room. And those everybody who knows me knows I'm passionate about helping active duty service members transition into their next adventure in life. That's one of my main things that I focus on in life. And you've got a project that I'm super excited about that uh, I just, all right, I'm going to stop fumbling and let you tell us about that project. Sure. Yeah. And so I think uh, I'll describe what we're working on first. And then I think it'd be great to kind of hear the story of how this all kind of came together yeah. and everything. Okay. So what we're working on is called Vet Journey. And so it's a, it's a web-based app that takes um, you know, all the, the disparate and kind of highly analog resources for, for transitioning service members and veterans out there and tries to consolidate them you know, and that entire experience into to one easy to use web-based platform. Okay. So then through that, we can use the power of data to improve the process, both for you know, the service members you're trying to exit. And then also, you know, eliminate some of the obstacles and barriers for companies that are trying to bring veteran talent into their organization. That that's awesome. And, and there's a huge need for it. I mean, I, uh, I was just down at uh, 10 special forces group, uh, last week or the week before. Damn, I don't even remember which week it was. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, and that was one of the things that guys brought up because we were there. I was there as part of the Commit Foundation, uh, guys from the Green Beret Foundation. It was like a three or four day seminar that uh, these these uh, Green Berets and their families were there to go through. And there's just so much. I mean, I've, I've talked with guys who have who have literally gotten to the point where we, we, the pendulum has swung so far in the, I don't know what to do, what to choose, where guys just throw their hands up and say, screw it. And they might as well, none of these organizations might as well exist like it was, you know, 15 years ago. So having a tool like this is going to be, I, I think is going to be a game changer for uh, helping soon to be vets uh, transition. We, that, that's that's the game plan. And I'll also say you know, huge props to, to 10th group for putting on a, a seminar like that. Cause I think, you know, there's the, the DOD's transition assistance program, everything too, but there's also a lot of great information you can kind of get at the, the unit, the unit level to digest some of this stuff as well. And then, you know, we've got a, a close knit brotherhood uh, like the SF community. I mean, that's just the, the power of that can af- absolutely be leveraged by people who are still in, uh, in order to sure, you know, they can get out and have a good successful transition. I'm really curious. Is there anything you can do to uh, provide some scale to this? Cause I think we've talked about it before in the show, like the amount of nonprofit services in the country, especially in veteran services. Uh, is there any sort of like number to that, that you can put to the number of programs and type of options? Cause it sounds overwhelming. It is absolutely overwhelming. And I'll be honest, I- I'm still sorting through, I, I'm trying to figure out that data myself, uh, like how many are out there and like how much money goes into that. And mm-hmm. it, it, it's absolutely overwhelming. And so I kind of, I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit and kind of talk about like how I started getting into this journey a little bit myself. So, you know, when I was first getting out of the army, uh, just a little bit over two years ago now, I was just like, this is a, this is a disjointed Charlie Foxtrot of a situation. Okay. There's, and there's three big frustrations that, that I personally felt. All right. And the the first one was that, and we, we hit the nail right on the head, just the sheer volume. It's overwhelming. It's a, it's just a, the paradox of choice of just, there's just so many things to choose from. And what I've kind of also seen is that like, no one really kind of does everything you can, you know, work with one organization. Okay. They can help you out with your resume. Another one will help you out, you know, interview prep. This other one will help you figure out, you know, what you're help you kind of figure out like that, that purpose mapping and fulfillment piece or something. But 
you kind of have to end up putting together this patchwork quilt of resources to go to and utilize. And not everyone knows about everything. And it's just, it's kind of all over the place. Okay. Uh, this is not by any means, you know, highly researched data or something, but a previous guest I had on my own podcast, a guy by the name of uh, Brandon Shelton. And so he runs uh, a venture fund called a uh, task force capital. And so they specifically vest, invest in veteran founders and Okay. And he was telling me, you know, the research that he's done is that the, the veteran cause is the most, it's the highest density of nonprofits for like any particular cause. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's just more out there in comparison to any other, any other cause out there based on need. All right. So then my, my second big frustration in the process was, you know, a lot of people get out of the military. You know, if you're, if you're an officer coming in, you already have a bachelor's degree, you're getting out, you, you know, you're, have a bachelor's group and you're getting out, obviously, but also a lot of enlisted folks pick one up along the way as well. You know, either they had one before they came into service or they just, you know, were knocking out credits over the years. Uh, you know, I, I know my, I was in civil affairs in my last job and my civil affairs NCO that I worked with, and he was working on his second master's while, while we were deployed. Okay. And lots of people are out there like that. Made you, made so, you ask yourself, am I doing <laughs> people like that? Like, yeah, absolutely. Wow, absolutely. Man. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so my, when you, when you're getting out, like, you know, there, there's this huge chunk of population that's a prime candidate and now they have the GI bill or, you know, voc rehab or whatever the program is. And they're not a prime candidate for graduate school, but being a veteran trying to apply to graduate school and understand like, how do I translate being, you know, a guy who jumped out of airplanes with explosives and mortars to then, you know, I want to go be a, a, a doctor or a lawyer or something. It's, it's tough. And, you know, I'm, I'm in business school right now. And that's like a very well trodden path for, for junior military officers. And even then, like we have a lot of challenges in trying to put together an application and translate our experiences, even though there's just volume wise, a lot of people kind of go down that path. And then the third thing that I felt through the whole process was just this it feels like the entire veteran transition ecosystem is built around pushing people into a, a job, just like a J-O-B job. And look, I mean, I, I got nothing wrong with just like getting a job. You know, if, if that's what you got to do for you and your family or something, awesome. But my point being is that, you know, we sign up to jump out of planes and go on patrols and helmet and spend six months living on a submarine under seas. Um, we didn't come back to just have things, you know, be treated like a charity case. People have bigger, bigger ambitions. Like we have a lot of things to give back both to you know, ourselves and our communities and then our country as well. Um, and so like, I looked at those three things and I was like, this just, this system just doesn't feel right. Okay. So my first thing I'm, I was an English major as an undergrad. I like to write. So I started writing about this and created a blog called the, the veteran And so, you know, I was working on that for a couple of months and I felt like I built up, you know, a decent amount of content and then the next evolution of the project was to start a podcast. So I started a podcast called the, the Veteran Semi-Professional. And so about 85% of my, uh, my guests are veterans themselves. And we talk about, you know, lives and careers after the military to kind of show people, you know, what are the career options out there, how you might go about, you know, doing a certain path or something. Um, and then also I bring on some other non-veterans who I think are just doing something really cool and have something to offer to the community. Okay. So it was actually, so I, I had mentioned Brandon earlier. I had, you know, interviewed veteran, interviewed Brandon, excuse me, posted about it. And then this guy named, funny enough, also named Mark commented on it and was like, oh, you know, there's enough like, you know, buzzwords in his title. I should reach out to this guy. And we set up a 15 minute phone call. And then we were on the phone for like an hour and a half. We're like, do we just become best friends? Like, yeah, I, I think so. And so we both kind of figured out that, you know, we, we really cared about this, this issue of, taking people from the military and have them start off in successful lives. All right. So we kind of sat on that for a couple of months and, you know, he already has a, a, an existing small business called military hiring accelerator, which is, you know, a veteran focused staffing agency. All right. And so it's for him, it's a, it's a pretty manual process of, you know, companies come to him and say, we want to hire veterans and he's got to go through and, you know, sort through resumes and do all the, the, uh, you know, the pulling out of trying to find candidates and everything. Okay. So he kind of came up with the idea for, for vet journey. So like, how can we, how can we have a platform, a digital platform that kind of solves a lot of these problems and then we can use that data in, in smart ways to improve the, the veteran transition process. So that's how he and I connected was, was through my podcast. Uh, and then he ended up teaming up with one of our developers. They actually 
live in the same neighborhood and they met up at a block party and, um, you know, Mark went up to Chad and said, Hey, you know, I, Hey, I hear you're in it. And I got this idea for this, this software thing. And, you know, Chad will tell you, people come up, like once they find out he's a developer, they come up to him all the time and say, Oh, I've got this, I've got this business idea, man. And he's like, cool. And he listens to it for five minutes and then he never hears back from them ever again. And he's like, but with Mark, we ended up, we were up until three o'clock in the morning, drawing this thing out on a whiteboard. And we're like, dude, let's do this. Um, so then we, we, we brought in another guy, Matt, that Mark had worked with in a previous company. And we're like, okay, let's, let's make that journey and let, let's make this thing happen. And as I was joking with y'all before the show, so, you know, we, we just launched our beta uh, last week and, you know, when we first started working on this thing, we're like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll have this done in three months, have this thing shipped out. And, you know, nine months later, here we are finally getting it out, but uh, it's, it feels good to finally get this thing out and start getting, you know, start talking with people who've been on the platform to get some feedback and everything. What, one lot, of the things I'll I jump in. Go, I'm going to let you I'll go, go first then. because uh, you, you can pick your favorite question then. <laughs> well, um, but I, what I'm really curious about is something I, I, I love about this is you're innovating inside of like efficiency and it's the sense of it's all of these existing resources and just trying to tie them together into a better service for people. Um, but what, what I'm curious about is how has the reception been from the rest of that, I guess you would call it sector industry, you know, of the other nonprofits and, you know, veteran organizations, has it been well received? Because these type of solutions sound great on paper. When we sit here and we talk about it, it's like, oh yeah, that's obviously the thing to do. But when you step on someone else's toes, when you get in someone else's area, then things get a little bit more personal and uh, a little less objective as far as solving the problem. So what what has that been like so far? That's a, that's a great question, Camden. Uh, and I, I, I should be clear and say, we're not necessarily trying to consolidate everything. We're not trying to take mm-hmm. every single organization that's out there and put them onto, onto vet journey. I think we're trying to consolidate the, the idea and like the, the value that they provide and put it into one place. Now we do think there will be some um, strategic partnerships with some of these organizations that are already out there. Uh, and we've already been in, you know, I mean, very, very initial talks with uh, some big organizations of they're also trying to crack the nut of like, how do we kind of get out of what is right now a very analog process and digitize it um, because we know there's there's value in the the data that can we that we can get from there uh, to improve the whole process. So th- there is some interest in some of these organizations of you know partnering with Vet Journey either to help us solve their own problems um, and then also you know be able to deliver their resources at scale. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I, I'm more uh, interested in <clears throat> the partnership. So you got you got four dudes, right? I can remember, like my math was right when I was counting. Mark, Mark, Chad, and Matt. Super boring white dude names. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Four <laughs> dudes. How did you, how did you kind of fold together? Because, you know, chatting on the phone for an hour and a half is one thing, putting things together is another thing. Writing checks to make sure you can start the thing is a whole other thing. So I'm just kind of curious. Walk us through that that story, if you will, of how y'all came together is, uh, and I'm just, I'm calling you partners, whether you right, right. are or not, but you know, y'all became four partners in this, in this venture. Yeah. So one, it was, it was a process. It was, you know, series of phone calls and, and back and forth. And, you know, at the, at the beginning, you know, the first phone call, we didn't even mention vet journey. That, that wasn't a thing at, at, at the, at the onset yet. So it was, we spent months in just the like relationship testing, learning about each other phase before kind of like the formal thing started forming together. Okay. Uh, so then, I mean, really the company, if you will, formed when, when Chad and Matt, you know, had that garage whiteboarding session and like, they had the good fortune of like, they already kind of knew each other. Okay. So like that, that eased some of that, that relationship tension. And then, you know, Matt, our, our second developer, um, He'd worked with Mark in a previous company. So like Mark had already seen his talent, knew who he was. Matt already knew who Mark was. So that was super helpful. Okay. <clears throat> and then when I look at, you know, the, the different things that the, the four of us bring to the table, uh, it was really just like a match, you know, like, what do we need to get this thing off the ground? Okay. So this is a, this is a technical product. All right. I don't know how to write a line of code. Spoiler alert here, everybody. Um, I know you said you're an English major. So I, <laughs> I can laugh at you. 
<laughs> Although just, just a, a funny little anecdote that I think is worth pointing out here. I took a class uh, last semester about, we did very, it's called software design, like very, 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 very basic coding. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go write an app out here anytime soon. And I remember our professor telling us, he's like, you will be surprised at how much of code out there is just copied and pasted or like Googled of how do I do X, Y, Z? And then you find the code and put it in somewhere. And I was like, no, no, there's no way it, it's done like that. Like these guys are professionals, right? Like they don't just like Google the answer and, and put it out there. And then I, I kid you not, the next morning I was on the, uh, on the phone with, I think Chad, and we were trying to work through something. And I was like, hey, man, what, what if we added like this kind of thing? And he just like Googles the code for that and copies and pastes and puts it into the code. And I was like, oh, that's that, that, that's how it's done. That's that's funny. Um, so yeah, we were trying to like met. A company that uh, quite literally we designed our whole data structure around open source coding. Right, was right. Very, the company was very successful. With yeah, 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 yeah. Um, now, I mean, if you want to like fine tune things and everything, like you got to have a lot of level of expertise there. When you start putting in, you know, a lot of like the back end stuff, like you're not going to get that, you know, strictly from Google. But so we're kind of looking at like the 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 matching of responsibilities and everything. And so like, we have technical product. Okay, we have two technical guys who know how to build this thing. All right. Then if you look on like either end of our our funnel here, you know, one we need to get veterans and service members onto the platform. Okay, and then on the other end, you know. Our eventual pain customer will be companies that are trying to bring on veteran talent. And we think there's some other customers down the line, but to start, that'll be our, our primary customer. Okay. And so on the first side, the, the service members and veterans, I've got a pretty decent audience already from uh, the veteran professional. So that's my, my website and my podcast and everything. So I already have people kind of coming to me like, Mark, how do I how do I have a successful transition? How do I think about post-military life? All right. And you know, when we when we launched our beta, you know, I was able to just send that out to, to my newsletter. And, you know, from that boom, immediately get people onto the platform. You know, I can immediately start scheduling calls with them to see, you know, what's the, the user experience been like. So that's been super beneficial to just kind of have a little bit of trust and credibility, like already built within our user base. And then on the other end, you know, Mark's existing company, military hiring accelerator, you know, companies are already paying him to, to bring veterans to them. Okay. So now we can go to them and say, listen, we're gonna be able to do this, you know, bigger, faster, stronger for you, uh, you know, once vet journeys online and they say, cool, like the sooner you can bring us to us, the, the better. Uh, so that we kind of had all the pieces of the puzzle between the four of us aligned to, to make this thing a reality. So how did you go, what happened in the 90 day plan through now, or I won't do the math, the nine month plan. What, what, what happened in there? Uh, and what's the lesson learned there, I guess. Well, I'd say the lesson learned is uh, whatever your plan for software development is at least times at times two. And <laughs> like this, this, this class I was in the software development, for example, uh, I remember telling my professor, oh yeah, like we're going to be done in November. He was like, okay, man. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, he's like, I'll, I'll, I'll give you February maybe. And, and you know, we, we get it out in March. So he was probably much closer on. And so I, I think the, the challenges for us, one was just creating everything from scratch, just just takes time. And then also just trying to, it's really, I think, easy to underestimate, especially when we're, you know, our kind of keynote feature is this a dashboard that kind of has, you know, a bunch of different tools and everything on there. And coming up with that is, is tough coming up with like a good user interface. Um, and even then, you know, we're not graphic designers or anything. So this thing doesn't look, you know, like we want it to really look when it's, when we think it's going to be, you know, further down the road, but drawing that up and testing it and trying to get feedback on it and, you know, going through iterations and, oh, and oh by the way, too, you know, we have three people who have full-time jobs and families. And then, you know, I'm a student right now too. Uh, it just, it just takes longer than you think it's going to. What would your, I, I guess, and not, not that there's some magic answer here, just kind of throwing it out. What would your words of advice be for somebody who's in that kind of situation? Because that's something I went through with one of my companies of like trying to put something together. And it was like, yeah, no, we can get this together a couple months. And, you know, eight months later, it's still not all the way put together. So, and I, the, uh, 
one of the things I've heard before is, you know, you, you double it, you know, you know, double your budget, double the, double the amount of time. But then there's of course the whole problem of like, then you're going to wind up using all of that money and all of that time, no matter what you're like guaranteeing that you're going to get it wrong. And then you're probably going to need to double that again anyway, because you're going to get it wrong again. So like from, from your experience, how, what advice would you give for somebody who's in that kind of a setting? Or sure, yeah. So definitely one of the most advantageous things for us was having having the technical talent on the founding team. That was a, that was a game changer in that we didn't have to, you know, they're, they're working for the company and like they are the company. And so we didn't have to have outside funds really to, to, you know, go hire developers or something like that. So that was a huge thing for us. Um, the second big thing, you know, we're able to fund kind of like, you know, our, our basic expenses right now through Mark's existing business. Okay. That was extremely helpful. And, you know, there our, our kind of game plan is that more or less, military hiring accelerator, vet journey, and the veteran professional will more or less kind of all merge into the same thing in the, in the future. Okay. Um, and then as far as like mindset and, and everything, we were, we were just disciplined on like, we met on a regular basis. Like we're going to get together this time. These are the things we're going to talk about and just make steady, consistent progress every week. And, you know, we didn't try and swing for the fences of say, you know, we're going to have this thing done tomorrow night. We're just like, we're just going to keep moving, keep moving the ball forward. And as long as we, you know, stayed on that, I think that was helpful. And then the, in the last couple of months, the discussion has been about when are we, when are we ready to hit send? When are we ready to like get this thing out in front of people? And I, I'm 90% sure this quote is from Reed Hoffman. He's one of the founders, who's the founder of LinkedIn. And he has this, this saying of, you know, if you're not embarrassed by your first products, then you waited too long. And I really tried to, to tie that into, okay, this, this is not perfect right now. We know it's not perfect. It's far from perfect. We got a lot of room to work on. Okay. But like, we have to get this thing in front of the people who are going to use it. One, most importantly, to just get their feedback on what's good, what's, what's not good. What, what else would you like to see? Like that feedback has been invaluable to us and way better to get something that's imperfect out in front of people and be able to get that feedback than try and wait for the perfect thing. Because you might think you know the perfect thing, but the four of us, you know, working on Zoom from across the country with one another, we don't know the perfect thing. But you know, just this morning I had like a 30 minute phone call with someone who'd been on the platform and he had a laundry list of feedback for us. I mean good and bad and some great ideas and everything. But oh man, like immensely valuable to be able to get that. And we wouldn't have gotten that if we had, you know, kept iterating and waiting and, you know, like trying to polish every last little bit on this thing. Um, so I think just that, that acceptance of having an imperfect thing, putting it out there to try and get people onto it and understand how they're going to use it. One of the best decisions we've made so far. And what was that first 24 hours like in that beta of like, you opened it up, the emails, the calls, <laughs> everything. What was that first 24 hours like? I mean, the first 24 hours, I, I'll be honest, I didn't really look at the, the, the analytics or everything. You know, I was kind of getting some updates from, from Matt. Um, at first, I, especially that first 24 hours, I really just let myself be excited. I tried not to get too wrapped up in the numbers and analytics and everything. And I was just like, this is freaking cool. This thing that I've, we've been working on for, for months now is out there. And, you know, I had, I had like a entrepreneurship class that I was in that day. And I went in there and I was like, we long story beta today, guys. This is awesome. And you know, my girlfriend and I had like a little celebration that night. And like I, I really just tried to take in the take in the moment and just be appreciative of I've got this thing out there. A lot of discipline. I, I, that's what I, the theme I'm hearing through. So what, what I'm wondering is what's what's a skill, and maybe it's discipline, but what's a skill set that you that you picked up in the army that's allowed you to to, I don't know if you want to call yourself leading it, but to to drive this forward with the other three guys, it, the discipline definitely helped for mm -hmm. sure. You definitely hit that. I think the other thing is just an understanding of of risk. Mm. <laughs> okay, you know when you, when you, when you think about risk of you know on a military operation, you're talking about life limb or eyesight. Okay, <clears throat> what's really going to happen if we ship this thing? too early. Eh, maybe some people send me some nasty grams and, and whatever, but 
there's probably going to be some good benefits out of that anyway. So I'm just going to err on the side of taking a little bit more risk there and, and getting it out. And I think just like our, our comfort with that um, was extremely helpful on us getting this thing out. And that's a key one, piece of it. I, I would say, I'm just going to give me the camera. I just want to wrap, wrap this thought up is that risk acceptance, because I think that's a, you, you mentioned this, uh, but it's getting to the point and, and Camden, one of your favorite things, you know, sharing your baby out there to the public and letting, letting the public tell you whether or not they think your baby's ugly, stupid, beautiful, whatever, and just being ready to, to adjust off that. That's that, that right there, that that's a mindset that you have to have. I'm saying this in the general sense, a mindset that you have to have to believe in the product that the solution for a problem that you're doing. Maybe not that product may not be it, but the solution is so important that you're willing to risk that. It's like having a, uh, a uh, an ugly baby, but it's really smart. You know, it's like, you're going to get there eventually. It's like, this doesn't yeah. look that great right now, but like, we're going to get there. <laughs> we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to throw over to both of y'all on this, because I think we've had this conversation with a lot of different uh, veterans uh, turned entrepreneur of, you know, the, just what, just like you said, Mark, about risk and how it's like, well, this is, you know, there's, this is so much less risky than what I used to do for a living. And, you know, the odds are so different, but I guess kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit on that, having that mentality of accepting a lot of risk can put people into some pretty crappy situations. So I guess to open up to either one of y'all, how do you square that with you? Like, okay, obviously this isn't that bad compared to what I've been through, but you also still need to calculate your risks and make sure you're mitigating what you can. Okay, okay sure. I'll, I'll hop on this one. So yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about like my my own personal risk calculus in, in going down this path right now. Okay. Um, so one, you know, personally, I'm in a position where I don't have a family to support or anything. So mm-hmm. I have a little more room for for uh, you know financial risk there. I don't have mouths to feed. I don't have, you know, I just sold my house at, outside Fort Bragg actually, so I don't have like you know huge financial commitments. On top of that, you know, I'm at a I'm at a great business school right now, um, and you know through the GI Bill, I'm going to be able to leave with with no debt, which is which is amazing. And I've also looked at it of okay. If this thing falls totally flat on its face and is just an epic nightmare disaster, I've got some good things I can fall back on. Okay, and you know I'm I'm not going to be out homeless on the streets or something. Um, and actually, you know, one of my professors here absolutely love her to death. She always loves to tell us. She's like, listen, if you find yourself about to be homeless on the street because you're working on your startup come let me know. You can live in my house and like, I'll take care of you. And I'll let you, I was, I want to see your dream to fruition. And so having that support network around me also, um, and that's just, you know, one person, there are other people as well factored into this timing of this seems like the right time for me to take this, this bigger risk than, you know, trying to go get a, a regular job at the moment. So in that same sense though, you got to have the right attitude. So where where the entrepreneurship attitude? Because you are by by, yeah, you 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 just listed out all the risks that you've mitigated, but you're still accepting more risk than fifty percent of the other guys who get out and get a job with you know booze, Deloitte, you know you name it. So what what drove you into the entrepreneur land? That's a great question. Um... You know, when I when I think of like my my first entrepreneurial endeavors, it was uh, you know shoveling snow and running a little lawn mowing business when I was twelve years old or something, uh, and kind of through that I just found like hey, I kind of like doing this, finding finding solutions to problems on my own. Okay, something is you know when I was eleven, it was people have snow on their sidewalk. Uh, I have a shovel. I have a solution to your problem. Pay me to take care of this problem for you. Okay. So I viewed that lens. And then it was also, um, I, I very much want to be someone who works on like big meaty problems that are, that are meaningful to me. Okay. And when I look at like, you know, some options that are out there, I'm like, do I, do I really want to have a lot of times we talk about risk. I think people just talk about financial risk, but I think there's also this sense of like fulfillment mission, personal satisfaction risk. 
And when I look at some opportunities, I'm like, is that, is that really going to fill me up? I don't think so. And there's a risk there that I you know, make a decision for you know, kind of like a, a, a more steady career. But then I look at myself 10 years from now and say, ah, there's going to be a risk that I'm not going to turn into the kind of person that I, that I want to be. And so for me, there's that opportunity risk that pushed me into, I want to do something that I think um, has tremendous impact on a community that I care a lot about. It's also something, you know, I went through myself. So like, I understand this problem and I have people around me that want to see this thing succeed. And I'm on a team that wants to see this thing succeed. And so those different risk factors kind of got weighed out in a sense of, okay, we can make this thing happen. We see a past success and all this other stuff will kind of buff out because we think this thing's going to work. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm laughing at myself because, uh, my my vision in my mind is the is the old uh, army's risk risk analysis worksheet, and I'm just curious. Do you have it posted on the board on the other side of the screen? Do you have yours? Like <laughs> you know, your scores, your, your acceptable risk, and and your mitigation techniques. And I am definitely not that organized. Uh, anyone who knows me will will tell you that is not how my brain works. Is having you know written out charts and stuff. That's that's not my personality. Uh, but some level, I mean, absolutely having used the, the army's, you know, composite risk management worksheet, which I had to do, you know, dozens and dozens of times Everybody played a factor, left the barracks, right? Platoon right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And uh, that absolutely played a factor into like how I thought about this decision. So like, when I think of, you know, if you're thinking of that risk matrix in the bottom right corner, that catastrophic risk, I'm like, okay, very, 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 very low probability. And I have a lot of mitigating, I have a lot of, you know, support mechanisms in place to mitigate that. Okay. And then when I look at the, the less risky options, I'm like, there's a lot of things to support this happening. And so this is a calculus and I'm going to make one decision over another. And you're, what you just, just explained is one of my favorite things when I'm talking with uh, our soon to be vets is you got all the skill sets up here. You just got to be willing to use it on yourself, which is, frankly, probably the hardest thing that you've ever do. You can, I mean, we've all planned, all planned combat ops where you're going to put some guy at risk of dying and getting killed, whether it's jumping out of an airplane or getting shot. We can do that, ironically. But when we flip it back on ourselves, it's like, oh my God, what if I screw this up? Ah, uh, I mean, even, even you, you know, you, you explained away, and I don't mean that to belittle it, but explained away your financial risk. Well, other people, they're, 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 they have a much higher risk, lower tolerance, if you will, and they've, they've got to deal with that, but they're not willing to understand how to mitigate it, how to make, put, that self, put themselves in a risk acceptance, what that risk is set there, there. Give me a second here. Risk acceptance. There we go. I think I might have gotten most of that word out. Risk acceptance. Of, of understanding of what they're going to do. And there's a lot of guys and gals out there that take those, those dreams, those ideas. I wouldn't even say they put them on a the shelf. They put them in the trash can in the corner of the office. Mm -hmm. And they don't ever try them because they're risk averse. They, they, they are so, they believe that the tools that they have from the military to help them plan it, to help them mitigate the risk, aren't going to work. But they'll they'll sure as heck flip it around the other way, go do a combat patrol in, in the Helmand province of Afghanistan, and look at it that way. I, I it's 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 ironic and it's a little bit of a foot stomper for me if you couldn't tell. Yeah, and you you, you asked earlier you know, like what I got from the military experience that kind of you know pushed me into this, prepared me, and you know, we talked about discipline and risk management. But I think one of the other super helpful things was just a a comfort with uncertainty of being unsure like what the future looks like and unsure what the next mm. you know day looks like and just being okay with that. Um, and you know, in the military, it, it can happen almost like like a minute to minute basis, right? Like you're <laughs> some point you were probably just sitting around waiting for the word. Everyone, if you serve, like, you know, exactly what that means. You were just sitting somewhere waiting for someone else to tell you what to do. You know, it could be just to go home for the day or it could be, you know, you're, 
a quick response force in Iraq and you're like, you're, you're waiting for the mission to go and you have no idea what that mission is going to look like. And we're just very, un, we're very comfortable with dealing that, with that level of uncertainty about the future. And so I looked at this and said, I'm not sure exactly what this is all going to look like, but I kind of see the general motion and I feel like I can have some, some sway and some input on what that outcome looks like. And I'm okay with not knowing exactly how this is going to shape out. Um, because again, like I've had some comfort in dealing with very ambiguous, uncertain situations. And that's absolutely helped me out in this as well. While sitting on green ramp, right? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those of you who know, you you know, or whatever. If you know, you know. Hashtag yeah. is, yeah. there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Damn, I thought you had some. So, oh, well, I mean, I was, I can't throw one out. I was just thinking uh, that's why veterans make such great entrepreneurs. And uh, it's why they need, we need more veterans as entrepreneurs, because it makes me think back to, we've talked about on the podcast before that uh, uh, essays by uh, Frank Knight and economist about a about hundred years ago. Um, but he talks about risk, uncertainty, and profit is one of them that we've talked about on the podcast before and how uh, profit is basically equal exactly to your uncertainty. You know, your risk in economic terms is things that you can buy insurance against, essentially. And so it's like, morally speaking, as the founder, as the entrepreneur, as the capitalist, whatever you want to call it, depending on your definition, the you are uh, taking on that risk, but that's not the profit. He ties the profit to that uncertainty. And I, that's what I always think about in terms of uh, in terms of the entrepreneurship of like when you're going out, not just having that impact, when you think about, you know, making your own life better, it's you're gambling on that uncertainty. The uh, one of the other terms he uses in that is uh, Gewerbs profit German from a German economist. And it's literally just like everything that you put into the business that we can't call risk and insurance, like, and, and can't call hours. It's like everything that's that, that's your Gewerbs profit. That's what you get out of it. And if you are the person who is more open to being in uncertain situations and dealing with those risks and uncertainty, then you're built for this environment. Yeah, you know, I, I I would totally agree with that, and I, I do want to say, you know, while I have a minute to say, I, I don't think every every person should try to be an entrepreneur. Okay, it, it's it's not yeah. for for everybody. Okay, it, it it's really not. You know, I have a I have a friend at school here, and he's got you know he was in the the Ranger Regiment before this, deployed left, right, center, sideways, every which way there was. Okay, and didn't get a lot of great time with his family. Okay, and now he's at school, and he's like, I came here. My sole purpose in life is to go into this one career track. And then I want to be able to spend like work nine to five and be able to go home and see the wife and kids every day. Mm -hmm. And maybe does that miss out on some opportunities for me? Yes. But that's like the, the life bounce that I want and is going to make me and my family happy. I'm in a different place than he is. And so my personal calculus was, was very different. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just use that as an example of it's not for, for everybody and, you know, not being an entrepreneur doesn't mean that you're a bad person or a weak person or anything yeah. like that at all whatsoever. And the message I try and get across is like if you're if you're feeling it and if the the risk calculus is is right for for you and your family, it, it's a good option to consider and there are ways to to make it happen for you. You know, I would I would say uh, I think that we tend to on the show use the very broad term of entrepreneur in the sense of like, are you taking control of your own life and making a better path for yourself? Yes, yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah. And because I do think that's an important conversation yeah. too, because there yeah. there is a very big difference of like the full on startup that kind of a grind versus right. being a small business owner. And you know, like what comes to mind is gosh, hundred episodes ago now, Dad, having Jeff Bosley on talking about acting, he's you know and drawing that connection to entrepreneurship and using those ideas. But yes, keep that asterisk at the end of the show. You know, Norman could put it after the outro. Not everyone is cut out for that kind of life. And if you want to spend a lot of time with your family and your kids and you want to go coach soccer and all that kind of stuff, might want to think twice. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, on my on my podcast and my, my, my site and everything, I, I talk a lot of it. I, I realize that the the risk of going the, the startup route, like that's, that, that's as far as you go down the the risk rabbit hole as, as an mm -hmm. entrepreneur, okay? And so I try and put out a lot of information about um, business acquisition, okay? Because that, that's a good way to kind of de-risk entrepreneurship, you know, mm -hmm. business acquisition, buying into a franchise or something. Like if you work your way into an existing business that's already started, already has systems, already has customers, is already making money. And then you can take that and grow it and do all kinds of great things with it. But that's, that's a way to like go down that path and get some of the benefits of an entrepreneurial life 
without taking on swallowing all the risk as the giant whale all at once via the startup path. Yeah, there, there's there's a ton of different ways. Matter of fact, we had uh, Andrea Sloan on a <clears throat> a couple of podcasts ago, a, a army vet up in Indiana who who did just that. She bought a business, you know, and. <laughs> I, would, I, I, I will always laugh when I think about her in that business because she had no idea about the business when she bought it, which is, you know, you want to talk about risk. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, uh, I'll tell you, there is a huge, huge appetite for, uh, from investors or small business owners to find veterans. Okay. Um, you know, I had a, a good friend of mine from college and he is now investing in small businesses. Okay. And he doesn't, he's not looking to run them. And so he specifically reached out to me. and was like, Mark, can you bring me some veterans? Because these are exactly the kind of people I want to run these businesses. He's like, I understand they don't know how, you know, financial modeling works and accounting works and everything, but we need people that know how to run a team that aren't afraid of, you know, rolling up their sleeves and getting dirty. They're not afraid of, you know, if we got to hop on the truck for a service call at five o'clock in the morning and it's 15 degrees in Wisconsin, a vet's probably going to be okay with that. And he's like, can you bring me people like that? Because like, that's who we want. Um, and the other end too, like a lot of small business owners just feel really good about passing on their business to, to a veteran, to someone who's, you know, served their country versus, you know, someone who just came from working at Goldman Sachs or something. They're like, yeah, th this is the kind of person that I want. And I want these values continued on in my business. And I'd love to sell you this type of business. I'm glad you said that because I actually have a former client of mine uh, who was doing just that uh, as a veteran and was quite literally hired by a VC firm to go find a business for them to buy, for him to run, you know, for five years, I think was their target date mm -hmm. and then sell for a profit. I mean, they're, they're, and that's just, that's just one of many variables. You mentioned earlier uh, task force capital. I'm sure they're doing something very similar like that, which, you know, for veterans, you know, your the vet journey app and that connection, just getting the knowledge out. Cause I can tell you when I retired, if I had known about a program like that, I probably would have jumped all over it because it would have been a much better fit than than going and working in, you know, big corporate America. So yeah. And the other way I look at this too is, you know, there's a <clears throat> You know, right now we have, you know, from like a macroeconomic level, this massive generational shift in wealth from, uh, you know, like a baby boomer type generation who's, you know, exiting small businesses right now. And they're looking for people to pass them on to. And, you know, in particular, a lot of those businesses are, they're veteran owned or they're service disabled veteran owned. And one of the things that makes that business competitive is the fact that it's veteran owned or service disabled veteran owned. And so they, they need a service disabled veteran to come in and run the business or else the business loses its competitive edge. And so you can actually like be doing that business a service because you can step in, kind of fill that, fill that role, run it, and then can kind of keep, keep that thing continuing alive and, you know, keep that business going, keep those jobs running and keep those customers being served. Uh, that's awesome. That's awesome, man. So, uh, as usual, my list of, uh, what I learned is, is lengthy, uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump on something that, that I think is not really a, a learn, but a re-emphasis is the consistency in meeting. That was, that was a key element, is a key element for y'all's continued success. You got together, you had a plan, you had, we're gonna cover these things and we're gonna do it this often. So many people get into that mindset of they understand, they got it. And when that happens, that's when the division happens whether it's partners, uh, teammates, people in your team, whatever it is, if, if you're not getting clarity in the message, clarity in your message between up and down, sideways, then you're going to break down and it ain't going to work. Just bottom line, it just ain't going to work. So, yeah, and, and I think it's worth pointing out too, you know, we have a once a week meeting. That, that, that's, that's all this is, you know. I, well, I, I have two, two times a week meeting, okay? Mark and I, we get together uh, Tuesday afternoons, actually, and we spend 30 minutes. We kind of talk business strategy stuff, all right? And then we get together with the two developers uh, on Thursdays, and we talk about the product itself. And those are our only fixed times that the four of us meet. Other than that, it's you know email, text, Slack, 
you know, we manage everything via Trello, but this doesn't have to be, you know, we got to get together every day for four hours. And, you mm-hmm. know, we were able to do this. Um, you know, we, we work in three different States. Matt lives in an RV with his, his wife and kids and travels around the country. Like we were able to make this happen digitally with, you know, only meeting twice a week. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Camden, what'd you learn? Um, the really applicable one here is the risk of not becoming who you want to be and how that outweighs the risk of failure in a business venture. I really love that. And, uh, if I, if I was thinking about hanging up the hat right now, that would give me the new fire to keep going. Uh, but I'm not in one of those moments, but I'll put that in my back pocket. Um, but I had to put one in a little bit of honesty, a second one here, dad, of when I open up a question to the two people in there, I need to pick one of y'all to go first. Cause that's probably about the fourth or fifth time I've done that. And then stared at everyone like, look, come on guys. (laughs) Yep. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Mark, how about you? What'd you learn? Oh, honestly, I I think what I learned about myself today is, you know, sometimes I kind of like think through these different risk calculations and everything, but it's rare that I kind of spell it all out and lay it all out at once of like how, what were the series of decisions that led me to this? And so that was extremely helpful for me to just be able to talk about that to you, uh, be able to talk about that with you all of like what that decision process for, for myself looked like. Yeah, that, that that's so true because you know we keep it all up here. And <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. And then you yeah. say it out loud, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm not, pretty I'm, smart, I'm, huh? <laughs> I'm not as dumb as I think. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, that really was a dumb idea. <laughs> it sounds yeah, dumber too. now that it's that too. That too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In there. Uh, yeah, no, Mark, this has been great. How do folks, uh, you know, you mentioned newsletter, we've got your podcast. What, what's, give us, give us some URLs, give us some places where people can connect with you and find out more. Sure, yeah. So the, the, the number one way is uh, theveteranpro.com, okay? So from there, you can find the links to the podcast as well as, you know, all, all my social media platforms and everything. Uh, I'm, I'm most active on, on Instagram and it's just there I'm at the veteran professional. Uh, then we go to LinkedIn and everything as well. Um, and then if you're, if you're interested in being a, a beta tester for, for vet journey, email me at mark at the veteran pro.com. And then, you know, I'll send you the link and we'll kind of go through the onboarding process and everything, but absolutely want, want your feedback on it to make this the best product possible for, for our service members and our veterans. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited to find out more about that product and see how it grows because, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely a problem set that it could help, help fix. So Camden, run us out. All right. Thank you all for listening to today's show. Special thanks to our guest, Mark Delaney, for joining us today and our sponsor, Tribe and Purpose. Find your tribe, find your purpose. You can check out recent episodes of the Cam and Otis show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and check out the full archive at thecaminotashow.buzzsprout.com. The Cam and Otis show is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks again. We'll see you all next week.